to AWARE. We are dedicated to communicating information that inspires your positive growth and change. Are you interested in a peaceful planet? Are you interested in optimal health? Are you living with purpose? Are you enjoying your life? We realize each person can make a difference, and our mission is to empower your awareness. The choices that you make in every moment shape your life, and we encourage you to realize that you have your own answers and to always listen to your own truth. We invite you to stay aware. Hi, I'm Lisa Gar, and welcome to the Aware Show Health and Mindset Series, where I get to talk with amazing experts about what life looks like in our new normal. How do we adapt to change? How do we embrace change and thrive during this time and going forward? We also need a healthy mind and body in order to adapt to what is happening these days. So thank you so much for joining me. A philosopher once said, to live is to suffer. But to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. And I would say that is to thrive, is to find meaning in the suffering. So maybe this is why suffering is a part of the human experience, so that we can really find meaning. Joining me is the senior rabbi at the Wilshire Boulevard Temple, Rabbi Steve Leder. He was twice named by Newsweek as one of the 10 most influential rabbis in America. And his book, his latest book, is called More Beautiful Than Before. It's a beautiful book where he talks about his own journey with pain and suffering and how it made him more available and compassionate than he was before. Welcome, Rabbi Leder. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Lisa. I'm very honored to be with you here today. So as to what I was speaking about there, is suffering a part of the human experience? Is it, does it have to be? <laughs> Yes, I think definitionally uh, it, it is what it means to be human. Uh, fortunately, so, so is love and so is joy. But pain is absolutely definitionally a part of what it means to be human. Look, if, if we are going to have the capacity to act upon nature, then nature is going to act upon us. The only alternative is to be an inanimate object, a stone, you know, uh, something like that. It, if if we're going to have feelings, which all humans do, those feelings are going to be hurt. If we're going to have bodies, as all humans do, those bodies are going to be damaged. So yes, uh, to be human is to suffer. There, there is no other way. Hmm. That's a great perspective. To think that it would be any other way would actually be delusional. <laughs> you know, to think well, your that it's alternative always going to be... <laughs> exciting. Your alternative, you know? is to, your alternative is to be made of stone. And, and who wants that? Right. So, yes. Uh, but pain, pain, of course, can be incredibly instructive and empowering as well if we learn something from it. And, you know, that's what we're here to talk, of course. Yes. And it leads to wholeness. So tell me a little bit about how your life has changed uh, prior to the pandemic announcements and responses mm -hmm. to now. What has changed? Well, you know, Heinrich Heine had this old joke about the Jews. He said that the Jews are like everyone else, just more so. Uh, and this pandemic has made me more so. Uh, first of all, I don't think any of us should have any illusions about the pandemic giving anyone a new personality. The people we're quarantined with, uh, our friends, our neighbors, our politicians, uh, anyone. Uh, this just makes everyone more so. So I'm a person who felt um, impelled to help others before the pandemic. I feel that pull even more so now. I'm a person who, uh, who managed his anxiety uh, with being a workaholic before the pandemic. Now I manage my anxiety by working you know, 15 hours a day instead of 12 hours a day. I'm a person who used words to try and help and to heal uh, before the pandemic. Now I'm using them even more. So, you know, this is true for all of us. This pandemic is making us more so. And understanding that and embracing it with some sensitivity and empathy, by the way, makes it a lot easier to get along with and live with the people that we're shut in with right now. Let's just give people the latitude to be who they have always been, just more so. Hmm. Interesting. So that could also go with bad habits, too, of being more irritating or more. Uh, Yes. Uh, Crisis-oriented. Yes. 
Yes. yes. And people, people who manage stress with alcohol are managing it with more alcohol. People who manage stress with anger are managing it with greater anger. Uh, you know, people who are depressed can become more depressed. And we have to watch out for the downside of all of this, too. Uh, the, the fundamental point, however, is, is not to expect some uh, extraordinary change in personality or way of being or seeing the world as a result of being in this pandemic. Pandemic is quite the contrary. It intensifies who we are. It doesn't really change who we are, at least not yet. It has that potential if we can, if we can harness that potential. But at this point, I, I don't think it, it's done anything to, to give anyone a new personnel. Well, you know, I think it also is instigated by the amount of uncertainty that we're experiencing, Rabbi Leader, is that we don't know what types of jobs we're going to go back to, if a job at all, for those of us who have experienced a loss of an industry. And being in the entertainment industry, I have experienced that. I have another company that has been shut down since the beginning or middle of March. And I have but, no idea. But Lisa, listen. Uh, if, if I may offer you something that I hope will be helpful to you and, and, of course, to the viewers. As unprecedented as this pandemic seems, and in some ways it is unprecedented, however, you have, I know, suffered loss before in your life. This is not the first difficult thing you have ever been through. This is not the first loss you have ever survived. This is not the first bout of uncertainty that you have ever had to face in your life. So I think it's very important now for all of us to remind ourselves that as unprecedented as this feels, in many, in fact, in most ways, we have all been here before. And somehow we have found a way to survive and to heal and to grow and to go on to lead lives filled with laughter and love again, despite our losses. And this will be no different. Having some faith in how you have managed in the past to get through these difficult times, hopefully will give you the strength uh, and, and the inner faith to know you'll get through them in the future. I also think since the future, as you correctly point out, is so uncertain, the less catastrophic yes. thinking we engage in about the future, and the more we stick with the present, the more mindful we are, the more present we are, the more we ask ourselves, what can I do in the next hour that's meaningful, productive, loving, healthy for myself, or for someone I love, or even for a stranger down the street? That's the better set of questions right now, as opposed to, oh my goodness, what is my life going to look like in a year or two or five? It's, it's not a productive way to think. So pull yourself back, stay on a short time leash, and, and ask yourself that better set of questions. <laughs> I'm really glad you said all that, because I was about to argue with you. I was, <laughs> I was about <laughs> to tell you. There's no way that this is, I mean, it is so unprecedented, but you're right. So you and I, we've both suffered the loss of our, our fathers, you know, around the same time. And yep. it is definitely, you, you build resilience muscles for loss of loved ones. And in mm. this, you know, the fact that the entertainment industry has been shut down, it, it never even happened in the Great Depression. And for this amount of time, and there are people who live paycheck to paycheck, that really don't know how their, their job is ever going to be considered essential. And That's, so I, I, feel, I understand that. Look, my, yeah. my son is laid off. My 30 year old son is living with us laid off and, and he just can't imagine how he's ever going to be successful in life. But we do know that people crave entertainment. People crave gathering. People crave theater. They crave music. They crave sports. Those cravings are not going to go away. Human nature is not fundamentally changing because of this. So there is a future. My point is, since the future is unknowable, both in terms of when things will restart and how they will look afterwards, what really is the point of all that anxiety attendant to those worries? It's much better to just pull yourself back from the edge of the cliff and ask yourself about the next hour, because that's something you have some control over. You also, by the way, have some control over your, your inner dialogue. You know, uh, instead of saying, oh, I'll never be able to do certain things again, how about saying, I'm going to do different things? Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of saying, I'm oh. never going to have my old job back, how about I'm going to be launched onto some kind of new adventure? And if I was successful at my previous career, I will be successful in my future career, whatever it may be. So 
you know, counting your blessings in the midst of this darkness. And I want to say a word or two about darkness if you'd like to talk about it and well, how productive yes. the darkness can be. You know, count oh, really? your blessings. Count your blessings in the darkness, and it makes a tremendous difference. What do you mean by that? Count your blessings in the darkness. Well, you know, let's talk about that verse in the 23rd Psalm for a moment. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, which is a psalm that almost all of us know. If you think deeply about a shadow, very deep, no matter how long or how dark a shadow may be, if you think about it, it is one at the same time proof, proof of the existence of light. You cannot have a shadow unless the light is somehow still shining. It may be obstructed. May be obstructed by a virus, may be obstructed by the loss of health, the loss of job, the loss of our freedom. But but this darkness is one at the same time proof that the light that was our past and will be our future is still shining. And mm -hmm. and we walk through this valley, we don't stay in it forever. And and additionally, um it, there's this theological concept, which in Latin is called via negationis, by way of the negative. And what that means in theological constructs is that you can understand what God is by first deciding what God is not. Now, in other words, when you take things away, something beautiful remains. Think of it uh, in terms of a marble sculpture. If you've ever seen a beautiful marble sculpture, how did that sculpture begin? It began as a single block of marble. And the beauty of that sculpture was created not by the sculptor adding, but by the sculptor taking away, by removing everything that wasn't beautiful. This virus is removing a lot of things from our lives that were not beautiful. The driving and the shopping, the driving and the shopping, the driving and the shopping, the meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Did I really need to be away from my family all those hours? Did I really need to miss that many dinners? Did I really need all those shoes and all those shirts and all those ties and all those suits? Did I really need all those handbags? This has stripped away a lot of nonsense. And without dismissing the terrible consequences of this virus, the real question is, what has emerged in that vacuum? What beautiful things in our lives have emerged as a result of the stripping away of so much nonsense? And can we hold on to those beautiful things? Count those things as blessings. Commit yourself to holding on to them tightly when the freedom to return to our former, frankly, insane lives filled with hurry and scurry and worry. Can you hold on to this going forward? That's a productive way to think about the future. I agree with you in terms of the non-essentials going away. It really has exposed where there has been a lot of damage done. It really has exposed that. And we look at our earth and how it's responding to the, yes. the calmness. Look at the level of peace we're experiencing around the world. It's yes. unprecedented. It's absolutely- I'll give you a tiny, tiny example yeah. um, that uh, my son is quarantined with us. He's 30 years old. He was cleaning out his childhood room the other day and he found our baseball mitts and a ball. And we went out into the backyard. We played a game of catch. I haven't played a game of catch with my son in 15 years. And, wow. and we said nothing. We didn't have to say a word. Just that back and forth said everything about that moment and, and that the beauty of what remains between us. So I really think this is an opportunity to think deeply about the beauty of what remains in the aftermath of this destruction. And, and can we make that, that beauty, a regular part of our lives going forward? And again, we at no point want to um, glorify this suffering. Um, we, we don't want to justify this suffering. And we don't want to dismiss the order of magnitude of the suffering. I'm not saying that any of the beauty that's emerged is worth it. I'm just saying neither is it worth less. And let's hold on to it. I, I appreciate that so much. And I do absolutely value the time I'm spending with my teenager, too, who's going to go off to college. And th this is just golden time, whereas this could be a total chaotic time. And so 
I've heard other, you know, people say that this is God punishing us and that this is the earth punishing us. Can you clear that up for us? Uh, I, I think it's, it's just plain wrong. Um, I, I don't think that God, uh, I, the God I believe in is not, is not a God that, that tinkers with viruses or biology. Uh, I, I just don't see it that way. Uh, if, if God was the puppeteer in the world and we were just God's puppet, uh, I'm not sure that's a God I'd want to believe in given the state of the world. So I just, I just don't see it that way. For me, uh, I believe in a much more horizontal God, a God that exists in relationship with other human beings, with nature. Um, so for me, I, I think that's a kind of medieval notion, even pre-medieval notion. Uh, and, and it just doesn't square with, with my understanding of the world. That's it a good also, thing to say. It's also blaming, it's also blaming the victim, right? Um, it's blaming the victim. And, and we all know that terrible things happen to very good people. Uh, you know, people are dying of this virus who, who certainly don't deserve to die uh, from this virus. I, I, I'm doing the funerals. I can assure you it's taking many righteous souls from us. So I don't, I don't see God's hand in this at all. That, that's beautifully said. Are you facilitating the funerals online? Is that what we've come to? Oh. Uh, no, but almost. Uh, funerals are, are very, very surreal uh, events right now. So the current rules in Los Angeles, at least, are uh, you can have no more than 10 people, graveside only, single household only. So the 10, if you have a maximum of 10, they all have to be living together, which means it's really three or four people at the most at funerals now. Social distancing, the chairs are about 10 feet apart. Everyone's wearing masks, including, including the clergy. Uh, you can't touch the casket. There's no handing of the shovel from one person to another to assist in the burial. Jews tear these black ribbons. Everyone has to tear their own ribbon. I can't do it for them. Uh, it, it's almost uh, it's almost Gilead like uh, for those of you who watch Handmaid's Tale. It, it's it's dystopian. It's and it's for me it's painful because I know it's robbing the mourners of so many of the most helpful components of why we gather for a funeral. Uh, and then of course, afterwards, everything has to be done on Zoom, the gathering of family and friends afterwards, uh, it all has to be done on Zoom. People are understanding, they're patient, they accept these changes, but this is one of the saddest aspects. Uh, this and people dying, uh, dying alone in, in the ICU. Um, another one of the rabbis uh, on, on my team was on the phone two days ago with a woman who called her to say goodbye and to say, you know, Rabbi, I'm calling to say goodbye because they told me I'm dying tonight. Uh, and this is what's going on. Uh, and circling back to your question about God, the God I believe in would never have a hand in, in that kind of reality. Mm. I can understand why you're busier than ever. You're needed more than ever. And the amount of closure and processing of this grief is going to take years for those I who think, have lost yes. loved ones. Hmm? No, this is a mark. This, is, this has marked all of us, and it will mark all of us, I think, for the rest of our lives. Uh, the way I'm already speaking about it reminds me of the way my grandparents talked about the Great Depression. It, it, it was a fundamental um, mark that never left. Uh, now, look, it's up to us whether that's a positive or a negative going forward with how we choose to live our lives. We're smarter than that, I believe. Now we have more tools, we have more techniques to be able to not allow it to disable us. But I just wanna to touch back real quick to the virtual grieving. And I do think this is something very important for you to address if you could. Of, um, you know, I have known loved ones who, people who have lost loved ones, they're in different states, they can't see each other, they don't know when they'll be able to. What advice could you offer those who are grieving virtually. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Reach out to the people you love who can help you remember and tell the stories again and again and again. It's better to do that in person, but it's still very important to do it uh, even at a distance. Uh, you know, the, there's a duality to memory. 
memory is beautiful and memory is painful. So whoever is grieving is suffering the pain of memory. And we want to help transition and move that suffering into the beauty and the love of memory. And that can only be done with other people. So, you know, keep reaching out, keep reaching out, keep reaching out and tell those stories again and again and again. Uh, I find it very helpful to take people on a kind of mental vacation with a series of questions. You know, when did, when did you first meet her? Where was it? Do you remember the instant you laid eyes on her? Where was your first kiss? Where was your first date? What was the greatest vacation you ever took together? Uh, you know, those kinds of things really help people process their grief. And of course, this pandemic hasn't changed everything about grief. Grief is a long and difficult road. You know, I often say to people, anyone who thinks the shortest distance between two points is a straight line doesn't understand grief because grief is much more like waves. It ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows. And then there are these rogue waves that hit you when you don't even expect them. And yes. this is the journey of grief, whether at a distance or whether up close. And, you know, there's no getting around that. There's no shortcut for grief. Doesn't and I think people it. need to be aware of that too. That hasn't changed because of the pandemic. It is a long road. That is very true. It hits you at random moments. The, the year anniversary is very surreal because it doesn't feel like it had been a year. Yes, it is. And I watched my mom go through that it. zigzag. Pardon me? Yeah. And you need, you need to give into it much like a wave. You know, if you try to stand up against a massive wave when it comes at you, it throws you over and thrashes you around and you're upside down and gasping for air. It's a much better approach to when it comes to just let it take you and float with it. And then when you can, you stand up again. And that's grief, whether during a pandemic or not. Uh, and, and that's what we all have to uh, have to manage. Well, it's, I think it's really important to speak about this. And thank you for that. And your book, More Beautiful Than Before, I interviewed you a couple of weeks after your father passed. And I remember, I remember. you telling me, and I felt for you because you were moving so fast. And it, it was a tough time. And then my father passed a couple of weeks later and I contacted you and it was I got it that we needed to slow down. <laughs> Both of us did. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. that's right. And, and we need to take care of our hearts and our souls. And, you know, this pandemic is also filled with loss. Uh, and loss is, is, a, is a sign, a message, a directive to hunker down, to stay put, uh, you know, and not to move on until the clouds lift. And to hunker down at one and the same time with faith that the clouds really do lift, that we walk through the valley of shadows. We don't stay in it. Uh, and I think that's also important. And I, and I know we're circling back to how we began, but it's also very important to remember, as unprecedented as this feels, we have all, because we are human, we have all survived pain and loss in the past. And the resources that enabled us to do it then are still with us now. And we really are going to find our way back into the light, every one of us. Well, you have a beautiful process that you use every morning, and I'd love it if you could share it with us. So I really appreciate you sharing this very intimate piece with us. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So, you know, Lisa, your viewers may not, that the book, More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us, uh, it's about 5% about me, but 100% about turning suffering into something meaningful and beautiful in your life. Uh, and my story began with a very frightening car accident that, that virtually paralyzed me from the waist down for a while and caused me to get acquainted with physical pain and emotional suffering in a way I never had been before. And so from that point on, there's a prayer that I, I say every morning. I keep it in my closet uh, and I say it after I get dressed and head out to start my day. And it's a prayer that reminds me to be grateful for and to take care of my body because I was a guy who, you know, was so driven that I ignored any, any kind of self-care really. So 
this is a prayer uh, that I say in Hebrew every morning, and I'll say it in Hebrew and then in English. And really, this is a prayer, as we were talking about before, that reminds me to count my blessings, one of which is the miracle that is my body, the miracle that is my body that requires uh, self-care uh, and respect. So this is my take care of yourself and respect yourself prayer that I say every morning. I'll do it in Hebrew first. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Blessed are you, ruler of the universe. Asher yatsar et adam b'chachmah, who has made human beings with wisdom. Uvaravo nekavim nekavim chalulim chalulim, who has given us veins and arteries. Galui v'yadua lifnei chisei chodecha, it is revealed and known before your throne of glory. She'imi patech achad mehem, that if even one of them closes, She'im yipatech achad mehem, that if one of them opens, it would be impossible to stand before your throne of glory for even a single moment. Baruch atah Adonai rofecho basar mafli so blessed are you, God maker of human flesh and healer of wounds. And, and this is a reminder of what a finely balanced network of veins and arteries uh, our bodies are, and that even a single one of them, if not appreciated, uh, can mean the end. And, and so this is how I start my day with, with great you know, gratitude uh, and respect uh, for for my body and and for the vulnerability of what it means to be human. It's also so symbolic of just appreciating every single little thing because it's a part of the bigger whole. I thank you so much for sharing your small heart with blessings, us. Right? There are no small yeah. blessings. If it's a blessing, it's enormous. Uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, "You either live as if everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle." I I prefer everything is a miracle. Yes, I do too. Everything is a miracle. Well, thank you so much. And it's a, a beautiful time to share with us. We really, really appreciate all that you're doing, Rabbi Leader, and for your, just sharing your heart with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I always love being with you. Thank you. Oh, same. The pleasure is mine. And until next time, I invite you all to stay aware.